agranular leukocytes lack visible granules in their cytoplasm. Granules are little vesicles that contain molecules. The two major agranular leukocytes are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. You'll notice that the lymphocytes are the second most abundant circulating white blood cell, just after the neutrophils, were, which were about 60 to 70 percent. So lymphocytes are very significant in the bloodstream. They're involved in what we call the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system revolves around lymphocytes to help protect you from pathogens. And it's really good at protecting you against those same pathogens a second or third time you're exposed to them. So the adaptive immune system has what we call memory. There's a number of different types of lymphocytes. The two big ones include the B lymphocytes, or B cells, and the T lymphocytes, or T cells. B lymphocytes produce antibodies. Antibodies are, are proteins that help attack the pathogens, whereas T cells attack pathogens a little bit differently. They will actually kill your own cells when they are infected with viruses. But we'll get into the adaptive immune system when we get to that section of the course. They typically have a longer lifespan in that once they start to reproduce and start to attack pathogens, they might last for a few days until the infection is cleared. Some of them will stick around for months, years, even decades. And this again has to do with the fact that they have memory. They look very boring under the microscope. They have a purple nucleus surrounded by a little bit of bluish cytoplasm. They're not the largest white blood cells, uh, but they're a bit variable. Sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. But these four are all examples of lymphocytes. Monocytes make up about 2 to 8 percent of the circulating white blood cells, and they happen to be the largest. They can get up to 20 microns or micrometers in diameter. So they're fairly large white blood cells. The monocytes develop into macrophages and dendritic cells. So the monocytes are a type of precursor cell. They're circulating in the bloodstream and then they might enter a tissue and become a macrophage which can phagocytose microbes and debris or a dendritic cell. They're found in tissues as well as lymphatic organs. Some will occupy fixed locations. For example, there are, there's a resident macrophage in your lungs. And those macrophages in your lungs sit and wait until a pathogen might have been inhaled. And then it'll go and phagocytose the pathogen. And then others are known to wander through tissues. Macrophages are very good at phagocytosing, but then they also do what's called antigen processing and antigen presenting. What that means is they won't just destroy a pathogen, they will process it in order to display it to other immune cells in a way to initiate a more robust and strong immune response against similar pathogens. Again, this is more of a topic for when we get to the immune system. What do monocytes and macrophages look like? As I mentioned, they are fairly large. They have a what's often referred to as a U-shape or horseshoe-shaped nucleus that's kind of curved. The best way is to find the largest white blood cells, and those are probably monocytes. So these are your agranular leukocytes. In summary, this table will help you review the lymphocytes as well as the monocytes. Again, you'll notice their normal percentages. 
their characteristics, their physical features, and then their functions. This table goes through what a differential white blood cell count is used for. The differential white blood cell count is a routine test that literally counts the numbers of white blood cells in the sample. Typically the, the results you get would be either numbers of these or percentages. We're going to stick with percentages because we already know what the normal percentages should be. One way to remember, at least the order, is the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. So neutrophils are the most abundant, lymphocytes are the second most abundant, monocytes, eosinophils, and then finally basophils. What this table shows us is what might it mean if we have high or low of each of these white blood cells. I'm going to point out some of the more important ones. When it comes to the neutrophils, I want you to remember that if there's a high count of neutrophils, most often it means there's a bacterial infection. For the lymphocytes, a couple things to remember. Many of our lymphocytes, especially the T lymphocytes, are involved in destroying virally infected cells. Therefore, if you have a virus, your body's going to want to upregulate your T cells. So when individuals have viral infections, they often have a high lymphocyte count. Except one virus, HIV. HIV actually infects lymphocytes and destroys them and renders your immune system very weak. So in that virus, you might have low lymphocyte numbers. Monocytes are involved in many different types of infection. So they might be high when there's a virus or a fungal infection or a bacterial infection like tuberculosis. So that one's a little tricky. Eosinophils and basophils are both involved in allergic reactions, so they'll be upgraded or upregulated if someone has anaphylaxis, which is a severe form of an allergic reaction. Recall that eosinophils can also help fight parasitic infections, so they might be high if there's a parasite on board. But recall that they do opposite things in the allergic response. Eosinophils help reduce the reactions, whereas basophils promote the reactions. One final note, if someone has a suppressed immune system, many of these leukocytes will be low. You'll notice suppression, immunosuppression, treatment with cortisol. Cortisol is an immunosuppressant. So many of these white blood cells are affected when someone's on cortisol or has some other immunosuppression. The next video we're going to discuss the platelets.